Hi everyone, it's Mr. H here. Today we're going to talk about the length of a line segment. And the distance formula is another way to put this. Now, you may have been ziplining before. If you've had the experience to do that, it's quite thrilling. Here's a picture of people ziplining down into the uh, Niagara Falls Gorge. Uh, it's quite an experience. You might wonder, how did the people who set this up actually determine how to put it together? How did they know how long the wire was that they needed to to suspend from the tower down to the ground? And if so, did they just take a really long measuring tape and measure that before they put the wires out? Or did they just take a extra long piece of wire and just cut off whatever they didn't need? How did they actually do that? Well, it has to do with this idea of the distance formula. If you have, in this situation, here's our tower and the ground is over here. And if we considered the ground to be, uh, let's say, um, some point on the ground, call it x2, y2. And then the first point is the tower. We're starting at the tower, x1, y1, and we're ending at the ground. So what's happening is there's a change in the y values that's happening vertically, and there's a change in the x values that's happening vertically. And so in terms of the people building this, if they'd been able to just go along in a boat and determine how far it was along the ground, and they were also able to uh, measure the height of the tower above where the, it ends, they would actually be able to use uh, something very similar to the Pythagorean theorem to actually figure out how long this is. In fact, it is the Pythagorean theorem, just written slightly differently. Notice that this is the rise, and this is the run. And so in terms of the Pythagorean theorem, the distance, we're going to say this is the distance, d for distance, the distance squared is equal to the rise squared plus the run squared. The Pythagorean theorem shows us that. Rearranging this just for d, you get this. Take the square root of both sides. So d is the square root of the rise squared plus the run squared. And so we could then recognize that, as we said, that the tower down to the ground is delta y. And the ground down to the base of the tower is delta x. So the rise is delta x all squared. And the run is the change in the y all squared. Remember that delta means change in. So if that's the case, we know that also that a change in something means one value minus another. So let's just look at this point right here. This is the point. Uh, the x coordinate is the same as the original x coordinate because it's directly below it. And the y coordinate is the same as the second y coordinate because it's directly to the right of it. And so if you think about it, the change in y, another way to write the change in y here, would be to say y2 minus y1. It's the second y value minus the previous one. That gives us the change in it. Likewise, in terms of the run, we could say it's the second x value, this one right here, minus the first x value, x1. And so rewriting this equation one other way gives us this. x2 minus x1, all squared, plus y2 minus y1, all squared. And that's the equation we're going to use to solve the distance of line segments in this lesson. You probably already have an idea of what a line segment is, but just so it's very clear, I'm just going to define it here. A line segment is a line joining and including two points. It's a line joining and including two points. The slope of that line segment is the same as the slope of any line that goes through those two points. same as any line that goes through or passes through those two points. That should be pretty obvious. And if you recall, slope, just kind of as an aside here because it may come into play a little bit later, slope is equal to the rise over the run. And just like we used for the other equation a minute ago, we recognize that the rise is y2 minus y1. And we recognize that the run is x2 minus x1. 
And so that is the very definition of slope. And that'll come in handy as we go on in these lessons. Remember as well that if slopes are perpendicular, they have negative reciprocals. So what that means in this case is if I have a slope of 3 over 2, um, the perpendicular slope, perpendicular slope would be negative 2 over 3. So it's the negative and you flip the fraction. So let's look at one example now. The first example is this. This says determine the distance between the points 5, 2 and negative 8, 5. Well, here we go. We have two points. There's x1 and y1. There's x2 and y2. And with that, we can just sub them in that distance equation and solve this. So the distance is the square root. I have it written right above, but in general, I'd want to write that first. x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1 all squared. And we would go x2 is negative 8. And x1 is 5. So we're going to go negative 8 minus 5 all squared plus y2 is 5 minus y1 is 2 all squared. And then we go ahead and we simplify what's in, this, in the brackets first. The negative 8 minus 5 is negative 13 all squared. And 5 minus 2 is going to be 3 all squared. And we have to expand that out. Some people make the mistake to think that if you have those two numbers, so if we have something squared, let's, let's call that thing squared as a, the other thing squared is b, then that is equal to a plus b. And that's simply not the case. And the reason for that is we could just pick some random numbers to show that. Let's say that a is 2 and b is 1. Well, if that was the case, we know they would add to 3. But if we take the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, that's equal to the square root of 4 plus 1, which is the square root of 5, which is clearly not equal to 3. And so this is not true. So it's important we don't make that assumption. So we need to take the squares of each of those first. Negative 13 squared is 169. And 3 squared is 9. And so now we get the square root of 169 plus 9. Well, that's the square root of 178. And that is approximately equal to 13.3. And depending on what the question is, it might say round to the nearest tenth or to the nearest hundredth. But that there is rounded to the nearest tenth. So it's that many units in this particular case. And that would have been the way that they would have been able to find how to make that zip line at, let's say, Niagara Falls or somewhere. Let's look at a couple more examples together as they get more difficult. This next example asks, classify triangle ABC as isosceles, equilateral, or scalene. And you hopefully remember that an isosceles triangle is any triangle that has two sides of the same length. We know that an equilateral triangle has all the sides are the same length. And a scalene triangle has all the sides different lengths. So it might look something like that, for example. And so those are the three types of triangles. So what we need to do to determine what type it is, is we need to determine the length of all the sides. And so what we can see from the, the graph here is we can see that A is at 2, 4. B is at 6, 0 and c is at negative 2 and 1. Now you might look at this and say, well, Mr. Hamilton, I can look at that and tell what it is. I can see uh, from c to a that it's going um, over 2, and it's only going up 3 to get up to 4, whereas uh, from b to a, it's going over 2, and it's going up 4. So it's going to be a bit longer from a to b than from c to a. And then I can clearly see that the next one is longer than the other two. Well, that would be great. You can tell that. But what you're actually doing is you're doing this math in your head actually you have that sense so let's actually show our work and see what we what we find and in fact um, your intuition is probably going to be right so let's let's do this what we're going to do to represent a length is we're going to represent uh, a b by capital a capital b with a line over top meaning a length and so we know the equation for the length is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared and when we put those two things together what we get, subbing these values in, it doesn't matter the order that you sub them in. You're going to get the same answers. I'm going to sub it in as A being the first point and B being the second point. 
If you sub it in the other way around, go ahead and try it. You're going to get the same answer. So let's see. X2, in my case, is, uh, is 6. Uh, X1, in my case, is 2. And then Y2 is 0. Y1 is 4. There's always X, then the Y. And so we square those. So AB gives me the square root of 6 minus 2, which is 4 all squared. And then we get negative 4 all squared. And you can see, hopefully, if you'd put those numbers in the other way around, you would have gotten 2 minus 6, which would have given you negative 4 squared. And you would have gotten 4 minus 0, which would have given you positive 4 squared. And it would give you the same answer. So this gives me the square root of 16 plus 16. And we find that to be equal to the square root of 32. Now, I'm going to keep them as exact answers here so we can compare them because sometimes they'll be really close when you round them. You might not notice the difference. So we're going to do the same thing for the others. Pause your video, do them, and then check your answer with me. So what you'll find is they're all different lengths. Now, they look drastically different. But when we actually take the square root of these, we find out that a couple of them are closer than we might think. This root 32 ends up being approximately 5.66 whereas the root 25 is clearly equal to 5. Root 65 is quite a bit bigger, but still not too far off. It's 8.06 when you round that to the nearest hundredth. So they're all pretty close together, particularly 2, but because they're all the different length, they, this forms a scalene triangle. Now you might have found different values than I did, um, but you may have used... Uh, a is your second point, and C is your first point. Um, you might have used C as your first point over here and B as your second point. Again, it doesn't matter. You should have gotten the same answers in the end, even though your first step might have looked a little bit different than mine. So now let's consider just how to apply this in a few different situations. The first one is how to find the perimeter of a triangle. Well, if we know the length of all the sides, we simply add the lengths together and we get the perimeter. So the first thing we would need to do is calculate the length of each side and then add these lengths together. Just using the formula we've just used. In the second case, it says how to find the area of a right triangle. Well, if we know it's a right triangle, then we can identify what the height is and what the base is. If we don't know it's a right triangle, the first thing we should do is, if not told right triangle, we're not told it's a 90 degree angle, then we should prove or show the right angle. And what we would do to do that is we'd find the slope of the base, we'd find the slope of the height, and we know that slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And what we would do is we compare those. They better be the negative reciprocals of one another. And we went over what the negative reciprocals were earlier in this lesson. Once we know that that's a 90 degree angle, then we find the distance formula. Calculate the base, again using the distance formula. We want to calculate next the height. And then we know that the area of a triangle is equal to the base times the height divided by 2, or 1 half times the base times the height. The last thing you'll be asked to do today is how to find the length of a median. Now there's a couple things to do here, and if you look at this, uh, start at what the last thing we would have to do and kind of work your way backwards. Well, we would have to find the length from A to M. Well, how do we find M? Well, M is the midpoint of B to C. That's what a median is. Any median is from a vertex to the midpoint of the opposite side. So what we'd have to do here, the first thing you'd have to do is find the midpoint of the side opposite the vertex it's coming from. And then remember the midpoint is found by adding the values together, x1 plus x2 and dividing by 2, and y1 plus y2 and dividing by 2. And then calculate the distance from A to M, or from the vertex. Calculate distance from vertex to M. 
There you go. If you have any questions, as always, reach out for help. Love to help.